This is part four in our five-part series on the coming of Jesus. The four Gospels all report the story differently, but they fit together perfectly. And seeing that can increase our faith. So one of the things we're going to do this morning is fit it all together as a story. Quick recap. We began by looking at the prophecies and preparations for Jesus' coming. We looked at how the world was ready, everything was in place. We looked at, we went through the Old Testament looking at prophecies from Genesis right the way through to the last book, Malachi, of Jesus and saw how incredibly accurate they were. And then we focused on the wonderful words in Isaiah about the coming of Jesus. Week two, God takes a human body. We looked at how messy the line of Jesus is and the historical setting that he was born into and brought us some archaeological pictures. And we saw that this really happened in history. And then we ended by looking at the reason that Jesus had to actually become human for our salvation. And then last week, we looked at five steps in John's gospel. So last week was on John and how usually people don't think there's a birth story there, but actually the first 18 verses tell a story and we looked at how this story is told in John's gospel. Jesus came from above and the idea of from above being the theme that goes throughout. Very powerful. So our goal for today is to feel ourselves as we read through some passages to feel ourselves what they felt when they heard the announcements of Jesus. And this is going to be in the Gospel of Luke. And to be challenged to respond in our own hearts. So I'm going to do three things. I want to fit together the four Gospels and just let you see how it all comes together. And then I want to spend... Um, the bulk of today reading through Luke, just reading the story and just feeling what's happening there in the story in the first two chapters of Luke. And then I want to end by thinking about how we can respond to this, what it means to us right now. Okay, so what about the four Gospels? Um, if you don't, haven't thought about it, you probably think that, um, well, they all got a Christmas story and maybe, you know, some bits emphasize others uh, more than others do. But actually, they're totally different. Let me show you in a summary here. Um, all of them have got an introduction except for Mark, which completely misses out the story. There's nothing there. It, we start Mark with John baptizing Jesus. Why is that? Well, Mark is shorter than all the others. It's a much more of a compact book. And Mark assumes that you've read the others and he's picking out some highlights in Jesus' story to make particular points. So he doesn't feel he has anything to add there. It's covered very well in the others. And so he goes straight to John. The others all have an introduction. Um, then uh, John is, as I spoke about last week, really focus in a different way, uh, really on the birth of Jesus and not much about the actual details about how it happened. So it comes down to Matthew and Luke if we want to look at the storyline. Um, and they switch between them. There's hardly any overlap. Um, we, we, get, um, uh, we get the story of uh, John the Baptist's birth, the shepherds and the Simon and Anna at the temple in Luke Whereas Matthew is the wise men and Mary becoming pregnant. Those two, they're completely different. So I'm going to spend some time in more detail now. And I spent quite a bit of time on this, really trying to pull this together for you so that we have a timeline for everything that's happened. And I see it's not showing my word on the right-hand side there properly. Never mind. So what I have down on the left, I've got the age of Jesus. And this is right the way up to the time he's born, that first line. And then I've got to try and see how this all fits together precisely. So um, let's. Uh, so we start off with a genealogy um, and some introduction, and that's all the, up to the time that he's born. And then we have um, 
uh, minus 15 months, an angel appears to John the Baptist's father. We know it's minus 15 months because John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus, and six and nine make 15. So it's 15 months before you get this, uh, Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And then uh, we know then Elizabeth becomes pregnant. And then we have uh, nine months before his birth, the angel Gabriel visits Mary and tells her that she's going to become pregnant with Jesus. Or, and then um, uh, Mary actually becomes pregnant. And then in Matthew, we read about an angelic visit here from Joseph, to Joseph. And uh, that's not mentioned in the other ones, but that fits in perfectly in the timing. And then we have pregnant Mary visits pregnant Elizabeth. And this is going to be, we told the timing here, this is going to be um, uh, about eight months before Jesus is born, and which means it's just a couple of months before uh, John the Baptist is born. And then we have Mary singing a song of praise, which we'll read in a minute. John the Baptist is born six months before Jesus. We get a prophecy to his father. And then uh, seven days, I'm guessing around seven days before Jesus is born, there's this decree that they have to travel to Bethlehem because of the decree. So they start to travel. And then Jesus is born. And uh, we have on the same day, the angels appear to the shepherds who visit baby Jesus in the manger. And um, to only be technically accurate here, it was probably a cave, and that they're in not some nice little stable. It was probably a cave. And we use the word manger, and we think of like a, a hayline little shape. No, it was a feeding trough that he was in, he was born into, a feeding trough for animals. And there were animals around. And these wouldn't have been lovely, clean animals like on Christmas cards. These have been smelly animals that were just, you know, they were, they were, it wasn't very hygienic, to say the least. And this is where he was born. And this is where he was when the shepherds came to visit. Now, uh, the, so that happened on that day. Then Jesus is circumcised on the eighth day. Now, the, the wise men couldn't possibly have been there at that same occasion. And I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, so on the eighth day, Jesus is circumcised. Sorry? The times. Okay. Which the way they counted days, zero was the first day. So it would have been seven days. And then according to the law, um, there was a time of, of a purification for the mother and it would have been 40 days when she would go to the temple. So at 40 days, uh, Jesus uh, was taken to the temple and Simeon and Anna prophesy at that point. So the, when the wise men come, they couldn't have come before this time because we know immediately they came that Joseph had a dream that they had to flee to Egypt. So it couldn't be before they'd taken to the temple, before the 40 days. It had to be after 40 days. Um, it's very unlikely that they would still be in the cave more than a couple of days, because people would see, no, it's not, you don't have a baby in the cave. And probably um, the urgent need of the census would have, have gone away, so the Bethlehem wouldn't have been so crowded anymore, and they would be in, in a guest room in somebody's house. By the way, you sometimes, some translations talk about no room at the inn. There wouldn't have been any inns at Bethlehem. The, the word is actually upper room, and it would have been a guest room. People in Israel were not to charge for travelers. They were to give travelers free accommodation, and that's what they would stay in a guest room and free accommodation, and they were all full because so many people were crowding into Bethlehem because of this census. So probably very soon after Jesus was born, they, were, they could move to a house, not their house, but a house that somebody let them in in, in um, Bethlehem, and that's where they were when the Magi came. So um, I'm using the word Magi. Um, the, the word, uh, sometimes people 
name them as kings. There's nothing in the Bible that says they were kings. The idea of three kings is wrong on both counts. There were not three. There were three gifts. The chances are there were, there were more than that. Um, and they were not kings. They were wise men or technical term as magi. They were people who studied wisdom from the East. And um, part of their wisdom was looking at the stars, and that's how God directed them. So they visited. We don't know when it was, but um, people say, well, you know, Jesus was two by then. Uh, but actually, uh, when we, the reason they say that is because when Herod saw them, King Herod said he inquired carefully how long ago they saw the star. And then on the basis of that, the time difference between now and back when they first saw the star, he calculated that he should kill all the, all the boys under two in order to, to, be, to, get, to get them. But um, that doesn't mean to say that Jesus was two at that point. First of all, um, I think that, um, that the star appeared before Jesus was born. And so God timed it so they would actually arrive in Jerusalem at the birth. The second thing is that uh, Herod would want to be as, as uh, careful as possible, and he was playing it safe, saying up to two, because, you know, you have a young child and you say to the mother, how old is that child? Because it's going to be killed if it's, a, you know, they're going to say, oh, no, the child's three. You know, so, so uh, he, he had to kind of um, to cast the net wider. So I think that probably um, at this point the baby was maybe... Um, a couple of months old, no more than that. That's my guess. Um, I've read a lot about this preparing for today and like studying it up and, and people, you can't be really be closer than that, but I would say probably because there wasn't a lot of reason to hang around in Bethlehem and so probably still a baby, still a, a, a tiny baby. Um, the word translated young child in some versions actually is the same word as you can use for an infant. So, um, less than 40 days, less than 40 days they, fl- they go to Egypt, um, all the children are murdered. I'm sorry, sorry, great, yes, greater than 40 days, yes, I'm sorry, thank you for correcting me there. Uh, greater than, after 40 days, they go to Egypt and the children are killed. So how long do they stay in Egypt? Well, what's really interesting is we, go to ha- we have some precise historical dates now because we know in 4, BC, 4 AD, Herod died. We've got very good evidence for that. And it's guessed that Jesus was born. Sorry, thank you. She's correcting me here. 4 BC. So it's it's. Um, it's estimated that Jesus was born about two or three years before that. And so the, the guess is that it was just at least two years. So we know that it was at least two years before Jesus returned to Nazareth um, from those historical dates. And so um, then, um, uh, then there's 30 years before uh, he, John the Baptist starts preaching. Actually, we don't know when John the Baptist started preaching, but it was. It says in the account that he was he was very strong even from a child. So you know, and he loved to go in the wilderness. So maybe he started earlier than that. But we know it was thirty years when Jesus was baptized, and that's the timeline. And we have one more event in the middle there, which is when Jesus visits the temple. And I think he's 12 years old, something like that, when he visits the temple. So anyway, that's the timeline. That's how it all fits together. Different accounts in Luke and Matthew, but they dovetail quite nicely. Um, Luke doesn't say anything about Egypt. He just says, you know, after the purification, he went back to Nazareth, but he doesn't say, you know, actually it was via Egypt. That's not part of his story, and that doesn't matter. So that's a timeline. 
And I think it's important for us to know that it all hands together very well. There are no contradictions and it fits history. It fits like the death of Herod, which is all very well attested. All, we know also things like the, the, the census, various other events that are happening, all fits in very well. And, um, you know, if you're trying to tie it down to what happened in a few days, well, don't be surprised if you can't because other historical figures have got nothing like the level of precision that we can have with Jesus. You know, you think of someone like the Buddha. Well, there's plus or minus 6,000 years when he, kept, when he was born. If he, I mean, some Buddhist scholars say, well, actually, he was a mythical figure. Um, so, you know, what about, what about other ancient religious figures? No precision at all. So it's phenomenal what we have with Jesus and the accuracy. And it can really strengthen our faith that it really is good. And the reason why the four Gospels are different, I believe, is because with four witnesses all agreeing, and least not disagreeing, then you've got accountability there and more solidity in our faith. So that's then, that's just very, very quickly fitting them together. And so we've done this fitting together. And what I want to look now, and this will be the bulk of our time today, is a closer look at Luke's account. And what you see in Luke's account, particularly, is the announcements to different people that Jesus was coming, like to Elizabeth and Mary and so on, and Jesus or John the Baptist. And Luke is particularly interested in their reactions to this news. How did they behave when they heard this? What's going on? And, and, and this is going to be interesting for us as we see how this is speaking to us. So let's start off then by looking at, um, I'm going to just go back to the beginning here, Luke. Uh, let's, look, let's start off in verse 5. The verse 4 verse is just like an introduction. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blameless in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Who does that remind you of? Abraham and Sarah, that's right. Now, while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, oops, sorry, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. I'm sure he was, like, like no one just hears this angel suddenly there, whoa. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. On most instances of angels appearing in the Bible, they say don't be afraid, because angels are scary. Um, don't be afraid, He said, uh, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will not, for he will be great before the Lord and he must not drink wine or strong drink. That was the vow of the Nazarenes in the Old Testament. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the heart to the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So how is he going to receive this? How is... Zechariah going to receive this. Well, how did Abraham receive this when he was told a similar thing? (laughs) How's this going to be? I'm an old man and my wife's advanced in years. Very similar. And then he says, uh, he says, how shall I know this? In other words, I want you to give me a sign. 
You know, I need some kind of proof, some evidence. So not the most faith in there, it's, but, and, and uh, there will be of doubt. And the angel answered him, I'm Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And he gives him a sign. It's not the sign that he wants, and it's not one that he's expecting. And here's the sign. Behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place. Um, be careful when you ask God for a sign, okay? Um, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. When he came out, he was unable to speak to them and they realized that he'd seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these things, his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. So nobody knows that she's pregnant because she's hidden. So, then we, so that's the first encounter, the first revelation we have with, with, uh, about what's happening. So the second one that Luke brings us is with Mary. And what's interesting is I think it's a deliberate contrast between the way that Mary receives this word and the way that, that Zechariah receives the word. And I think Luke is, is getting us to notice that. So let's look at Mary. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in, of Galilee named Nazareth. So this is a pretty important, this is like a major angel here. <laughs> to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at the saying and just tried to, tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. <laughs> what does this mean? What's coming? And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. Once again, don't be afraid, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Wow. And in other words, you're the one, Mary, that the ages have been waiting for. You're the one that all the prophetic words have been speaking of. It's you. So she doesn't, her response is not doubting. It's not saying, give me a sign. It's just like, okay, we need to like, what's going to happen here? How will this, how is this going to happen since I'm a virgin? Uh, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Wow. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Now, she didn't ask for a sign, but she's given a sign because nobody knows this. And this is a sign she's given. Uh, nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. So this was faith. This was saying, yeah, let it happen. I'm going to, I'm going to put myself into your hands. And the angel departed from her. Well, we'll come back to these words at the end. Uh, then, so then we have, she visits Elizabeth. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. Isn't this amazing? This is the baby that's filled with the Spirit, even from the womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, 
Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the shout of your greeting, the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt with joy. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Can you imagine how this felt to Mary to hear this? Can you imagine that? Like this is such affirmation that this that she hears this. Nobody's told Elizabeth this. And here she's hearing this, the same story. And this is the mother of my Lord, she says. So Mary responds with this wonderful song of praise, which we call the Magnificat after the first few words. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked on the humble position of his servant. For behold, from now on, generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought the mighty down, the, brought, sorry, brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble position. He's filled the hungry with good things and the rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. She realizes this is the fulfillment in her to the promise to Abraham. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So she would have stayed there just, up, just she would have left just before the birth. So that's the that's the uh, the next event. So then we move to the birth, and uh, I'm just skipping a few verses here. Verse 37 says, "Now the time came to give birth, and uh, they need to find a name. They made signs to the father, inquiring what he wanted to call to be, him to be called, and he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John, because the name they were going to name Zechariah after his father, and so this was the step of faith." And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosened and he spoke and blessing God. And fear came on all the neighbors and all these things were talked about for all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid up them up in their heart saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. So this then Isaiah gives a prophecy. Sorry, Zechariah. Thank you, Anne's doing a great job correcting me here, thank you. Uh, Zechariah gives a prophecy, um, and uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, he prophesies, uh, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David. Then I'm skipping a few verses. And to you, child, you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our, our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. Isn't that beautiful? The sunrise will visit us from on high. Speaking of Jesus. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in the spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Jesus. So we're getting some momentum built here in these announcements. We have the, um, the announcement to Zechariah, and then the announcement to which he has a bit of a problem with uh, believing, and then we have the announcement to Mary, and then the encounter with Elizabeth, and then Zechariah's prophecy here. And you get the excitement building here about what's going to happen when this child comes. So then we have Jesus born. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went down to be registered, each to his own town. 
So this is a historical fact to tie into history. Joseph also went up from Galilee because Joseph was of the line of David and he had to go back to where his ancestral home was so that they could count properly. And uh, Joseph went up from Galilee in the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. As I said, that's really guest room of somebody's house. Then we have the next announcement. At the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I'll bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So how are they they going to respond? Are they going to respond with faith? Yes, they do. When angels went away into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. And But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So next Sunday on Christmas Day, I'm going to spend a bit more time talking about the shepherds because there's some extra things that we can learn from this story I'm not going to go into now. But um, uh, it's also interesting to see Mary, Mary's thoughts at this point because you can imagine maybe a little bit of an anticlimax for her. You know, she's told she's going to be in her womb is the son of God. And then like she can't even get a place better than a cave to have the baby. What's going on? But then God, I think, sent to encourage her, sends these shepherds. Okay, it's all right. There's something happening here. And uh, God is still at work. So... She's pondering these things. What is this? Is, this is not what I expected. I, this is still God working, but like, is this going to be what it's like? Caves all the time? What's going to, it going to be like? And uh, so the shepherds return. And the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So one last story. They, uh, 40 days later, they're taken to the temple uh, and it says there's a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he'd seen the Lord's Christ. Can you imagine that? He's an old man, but he knows he's actually going to see the Son of God before he dies. Can you imagine what it's like? Everyone who comes in thinking, is this the one? Spirit, Holy Spirit, is this the one? No. And then another, and then he suddenly he sees it. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child to Jesus to do for it, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed him and said, Lord, you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and, and for glory to your people, Israel. And just one more little story. Um, uh, oh, 
just a bit more of what Simeon said. Simeon says to Mary, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel for a sign that's opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So, which of course would refer to him, her losing him on the cross. And then we have the last story, the prophetess Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. So seven years after she's married, her husband dies. Then she's a widow until she was 84. She's 84 years old. She did not depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day. Isn't this amazing? Like she's, she's expecting something. <laughs> she might have not had the, the re exact revelation that Simeon had, but she's expecting something. And coming at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So it just, uh, I don't know about you, but just reading those scriptures today really touches me. Like it just, it just speaks something into me, this excitement about Jesus coming, reinforcing the, the truth that, that God did this for us. And uh, I, I, want to, I want to end my last point here by talking about how this relates to us. And I want us to go back to the story of the contrasted Zechariah and Zechariah and um, Mary. And I want us to think right now how you are receiving a truth that is actually even greater than was given to Mary. And you might say, what, even greater? Yeah, because God is saying to you, you are my child, and you are going to be with me for eternity. I will not withhold from you any good thing because I've given you my son. You are precious. You are like the, the when it says we're the apple of God's eye, it's literally the pupil of God's eye, which they call the apple. It's like, it, you are so precious to me. It's like my own eyes. That's how precious you are. And this is God saying this. Can you receive this? I want you to think of yourself like Mary now. This is a truth that is even more staggering than was given to Mary. What are you going to do with it? You've got a choice. Are you going to be like Zechariah here? And Zechariah says, yeah, God, give me a sign. I, I want to know, is this really true? Uh, or are you going to be like Mary and you're going to, going to say, uh, let's just get to her response. Uh, I, uh, I'm your servant, God. God, I'm your servant. I want to follow you. I want to, I want to respond according to your word to me. So you have a choice right now to be a Zechariah or a Mary because the truth that's given to you this morning is even more extraordinary than was given to Mary. And the, the, the question here really is this, um, are you going to live out of this new identity? Are you going to live out of this? Are you going to just live as if you're just another human being on this planet who's going to be born and die? Or are you going to live as a child of eternity who has a destiny on them? And you have a choice. What that looks like in your life might be different from person to person. It was different for Mary. But I want to challenge you this morning about who you are. Because God is saying this to you. To, what is it to be called a child of God? That we should be called his children, his sons and daughters. Not just in a technical sense, but so dearly beloved that he wants us to be with him for eternity, sharing his space for eternity. Can you receive that? Can you? I'm not seeing any nods here. <laughs> Yeah, maybe some very, very cautious nods. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's just pray then, shall we? Uh, 
announced. Father, we do thank you for the extraordinary announcement that Mary received and she believed. And Lord, we thank you that you've given us this morning an, an even greater opportunity of believing that you are offering us eternity with you as your own children so dearly beloved that you would give your own son for us. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We pray that we will live our lives out of this identity. In Jesus' name, amen.